everybody and welcome and or welcome back to my channel. So today marks the third video in my experimental makeup monster series. So as with my last two videos in honor of spooky season, I'm choosing four monsters, doing makeup looks inspired by them and sharing their lore. I'm not choosing the typical monsters, so you may or may not have heard of these or you may not know a lot about them. So hopefully you can learn a thing or two from these videos. Disclaimer, while I do work to research accurately, I'm not an expert. So please, if you have anything more to add, please be sure to do so in the comments. So if you watch my unicorn video or my chimera video, you kind of know how this works. So this next um, creature that I'm picking is going to be the Dibuk, the lore and mysticism of the Dibuk. So we're kind of ascending up the scare ladder a little bit, you know, where we start kind of miles and then crescendo into something a little more horrifying. Um, yeah, so given that this is in Jewish mysticism, I did enlist a friend to help me with some of these pronunciations. So hopefully um, I don't muck it up too badly, but I did try. I just want to put that out there. Um, I think that's all I have to say about that, but so let's go ahead and get into the lore of the Dibuk. Okay, so I have pulled out a bunch of things that I think say Dibuk. So I've got the Nubian Tube by Juvia's Place. I think these colors are very, you know, like spiritual or... Yeah, I think that that work, spiritual. And then I pulled out some of these like grungy sort of colors. This is Queen of Hearts from... Davina, I think. This is something. Team Captain from ColourPop. This is this is Piper's Piping from Sydney Grace. This is also from Sydney Grace. This is Hot Stuff from Sydney Grace. This is Desma from Davina. This is Lords of Leaping, also from Sydney Grace. This is Troops, also from Sydney Grace. Dark Chocolate from Sydney Grace. And Defiance from Sydney Grace. So this is a Sydney Grace thing look, I guess. I, I reckon, I don't know. And then I also pulled out this highlighter from ColourPop, this is Avalon. And then I pulled out a bunch of lip products that I think, you know, in my bag of goodies here. I pulled out this NYX Liquid Suede. This is like a taupey kind of color uh, in Brooklyn Thorn. This is Prapa's Limitless, Prapa's Fighter, um, ColourPop. This is like a brown lip gloss in Jubilee. This is the Pat McGrath Opulus lip gloss in Dreamscape. Dreamscape. And this is from Melt Cosmetics. This is Ebony. So, yeah, a whole bunch of things that I think give the essence of the book. And as per usual, everything that I actually end up using will be in the description box. So before we actually get into what a Dibbuk is, I feel it important to set a quick foundation, and that is the Kabbalah. So sometimes translated as mysticism or occult knowledge, the Kabbalah is the part of the Jewish tradition that deals with the essence of God. Kabbalists believe that God works in mysterious ways, as most of us do, and true knowledge and understanding of that inner mysterious process is obtainable, and through that knowledge, greater intimacy with God can be attained. Its practitioners tend to view um, God, you know, the creator God, and its creation, earth and humanity, as a continuum rather than distinct separate entities. So, you know, you can move along that continuum. The Zohar, which is a collection of mystical commentaries, on the Torah is considered to be the underpinning or the kind of basis of the Kabbalah. So a Kabbalistic mystic named Isaac Luria aka Ari or Ha'ari which I think means the lion who is considered to be the father of the modern Kabbalah laid the grounds for the Jewish belief in the Dibbuk with his doctrine on the transmigration of souls aka the Gehul which he saw as a means whereby souls could continue their task for self-perfection. So since Luria didn't really tend to write things down, his, his disciples took it one step further with the notion of possession by a Dibuk. The greatest of this was Hayim Vital, who later set, was the one that set his teachings down into writing, because like I said, dude did not like to write things down. So Luria's works really emphasize the correlation between the physical and spiritual worlds and the cooperation of tr spiritual beings with humans on earth. He described this relationship as a method by which imperfect souls could transmigrate or cooperate with men on earth to attain spiritual perfection. 
So in effect, that is the stage from which the idea of the books develop, which brings us to... So in Jewish mythology, a Dibuk is a malicious, possessing spirit believed to be the dislocated soul of a dead person. It supposedly leaves the host body once it's accomplished its goal or sometimes after being exercised. So the term Dibuk was actually introduced into literature only in about the 17th century or the 1600s from the spoken language of German and Polish Jews. It's an abbreviation of... Hi, it's editing me. So here is my terrible Hebrew. It is the book me rua ra'a. Or a cleavage of an evil spirit, or the book mean ha hijonim, which means dibuk from the outside, which is found in man. The attachment of the spirit to the body became the name of the spirit itself. Now I'm just bronzing up, you know how it is. Well, I might actually, okay, so I'm gonna bronze my forehead, but I think I might actually contour my cheeks because like, I don't know, Dibbuk, dead. Yeah, like that, that makes sense. You know, being very sallow, you know? You know, trying to keep like their skeletal. Let me, yeah, let me do that. I haven't actually like contoured in who knows how long. So I actually have, you know, the Fenty contour right here and ebony as well. So yeah, let's get like very like, you know, sunken in cheeks. I'm kind of trying to give that, you know, dead girl walking look a little bit, but very glam. So belief in spirits such as difficult but other spirits as well was especially prevalent in the 16th and 17th century, so the 15th and 1600s in Eastern Europe. I'm going to talk my nose a little bit too, which I never do, but again, we're going for, you know, skeleton. <laughs> I'm also going to take it in like my sockets because I think that will also give skeleton. I'm having fun. <laughs> anyway, so now that that's done. So the Hebrew verb from which the word dibuk is derived is also used to describe the cleaving of the pious soul to God. So the two are like mirror images of one another. Okay, I think that's good for the face. So I'm going to go ahead, you know, it is Jimmy's Place Primer and prime the eyes. Okay, I know I literally just showed you what I brought out, but I decided I want to use a red real quick. So I'm going to go into my Vida palette from Melt, and I'm going to use the shade Mexicana right here, this red, to kind of start out in the crease. So Dibbits were considered generally to be souls which, because of the enormity of their sins, were not allowed to transmigrate, you know, like Luria said, and as spirits sought refuge in the bodies of the living. So the entry of a Dibbuk into a person was a sign of them having committed a secret sin which opened up the door for the Dibbuk to come in. I'm also taking this lighter kind of like clayey red color and that's going in the inner part of the crease. Okay, you can't really see much of a difference, but I see a difference. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it. Next, I'm taking this shade from Sydney Grace, and then after that, I'm going into the Nubian 2, and I'm going to use this purpley shade on the way outer crease. So Dibbuks tend to seek out people who face similar challenges that they face in their living life, and so they attach themselves to those bodies. They're said to have escaped from Gehenna, which is the Jewish purgatory, or even have been turned away from Gehenna, for transgressions that were too serious for the soul to be allowed entrance. And you can kind of fill in the blanks on what those might be. So the Dibbuk may attempt to cause the host, so the person that they're inside of, to make the same sort of mistakes or sins that it did in its own lifetime. So it may be drawn to a person whose body and spirit are not fully connected with each other. So examples of this include very severe depression, psychosis, or use of drugs. Okay, so I want this to be a little bit darker than it is. 
So I'm gonna take the teensiest bit of like the only black that I have, which is in my blush tribe, Pasina 2, which isn't available anymore, but I have a black in it. So I'm gonna take the teensiest bit of that and mix it in with this purpley reddish color because, you know, I just want it to be like a little bit darker. So the rabbi Gershon Winkler says, it seeks a particular person who in their current lifetime is going through what the possessing spirit went through. And so the possessing spirit is drawn to compatibility, to someone who is struggling with the same thing it did. Let's say in my heart, I have a desire to rob all convenience stores, but I don't follow through because I don't have the guts. The spirit of someone who's actually done it will be drawn to my desire to do it and will possess me because we are compatible. So I'm kind of going back over with that right because it got lost just a tad. So in essence, in order to avoid being divot bait, the mind, the body, and the soul must be one. So the door isn't like wide open for the divot to just slip on through and cling to you. But should you find yourself in the clutches of a divot, there is a way to get rid of them. Which brings us to... Okay, so I want to cut my crease, but I don't want to cut it like like a normal cut crease. I kind of want to do like a cut and then a, like a like a cut this way, like almost like an eyeliner. I don't know how to explain it. I think I'm explaining it badly, but I've never done anything like this. So it's going to be a challenge. We shall see how it goes. Okay, that's not quite what I was going for, but it's probably as good as it's going to get. So we're just going to go with it. So Isaac Luria, as we mentioned earlier, had explicit instructions for getting rid of the Dibbuk. The literature of Luria's disciples contains many stories and protocols for the exorcism of the Dibbukim or the Dibbuk. So I think I'm going to start with this kind of like purpley taupe color. Then I think I'm going to go in with that gold color. So Luria actually popularized the use of incantations, both um, for mystical purposes and to ward off demons. They were called Tikkun Shabbat. So they exercised the dipit from the body, which was bound by it and simultaneously redeemed the soul, providing a Tikkun, I think is how you say that, providing a Tikkun restoration for him, either by transmigration or by causing the Dibbuk to enter hell. The point of the exorcism was to heal the person being possessed and the spirit doing the possessing. The same Rabbi Winkler said, we don't drive anything out of the body. What we want to do is heal the soul that's possessing and heal the person. It's all about healing. We do the ceremony on behalf of both people. So the process of exercising typically involves nine Jewish people plus a rabbi called a or master of the name, who is said to work miracles. The ceremony is not normally one of overpowering the Dibbuk, but first kind of like shocking it, and then dialoguing with it in an attempt to see what it wants and what would it take for it to leave. So the group recites Psalm 91, and the rabbi blows a shofar or a ram's horn in a specific pattern with the goal of shaking the spirit loose from the host so they can dress it separately. So they're kind of literally trying to dislodge the the spirit from the host. I'm now taking defiance from Sydney Grace and that's going on like the way outer corner. Again, the point being to heal the soul of the individual or save the soul of the individual as well as release the Dibbuk. So while many Jewish people today no longer accept the idea of Dibbuks and their influence, in some communities, so ceremonies to liberate people from the Dibbuk possession are still being performed, which brings us to... Okay, so maybe I can like kind of cut it a little bit with that dark purple. I don't know. Yeah, close enough. Anyways, so... While the term Dibbuk has appeared in a number of 16th century writings, it's largely ignored until this guy, Shloimi Zanbil Rappaport, aka S. Ansky's 1914 play, The Dibbuk, which popularized the term in a lot of literary circles. I just remember, I have an army green eyeliner, so I'm going to use it. This one is from Maybelline. It is called Jade Olive, so I'm going to do that. So I believe that the most notable, uh, public example of the Dibbuk in recent popular culture is probably 2012's The Possession, 
which was indeed the inspiration behind this video if you didn't know. It scared the crap out of me, which isn't difficult to do because I'm such a wimp, but nonetheless, it did scare me. So the possession is actually inspired by the story of the Dybbuk box, which was created by a Kevin Manis of Portland, Oregon. And I say it's a story because he's actually, I think in like 2019, he actually came out and said that he made the whole thing up. But I mean, a lot of people thought it was real for 20-ish, 15, 20 years. But yeah, he admitted he made it up in an article that I'll link down below. But anyways, so the story... So the short and sweet of that story is that Manis purchased the box in 2001 from the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor who immigrated to the US and the box of, is one of three possessions that she owned. He was told to never open it because of the evil inside, but of course in true horror movie fashion he did not listen. So I think I'm gonna use that black again on the bottom. I there we go. So after opening the cabinet, he found a series of strange objects inside. Two US wheat pennies dating to 1925 and 1928, two locks of hair, a dried rosebud, a four-legged candlestick, a golden wine cup, and a granite sculpture inscribed with the Hebrew word Shalom. The Shema, a prayer, considered to be one of the most important in Judaism, was carved in the back of the cabinet. Okay, I just had an idea. I kind of want to do little flicks at the edge of this black. No, I'm not like they won't be even, but we're going to try nonetheless. Mm, close enough, I guess. So as you would expect, weird things happen with the box over the next two years that he had it. And he posted it for sale on eBay in 2003, detailing all of this in excruciating detail, the lore of the Dybbuk box. So it's gone through a few owners since him, but now um, it's currently in possession of none other than Zach Bagans of Ghost Adventure, AKA Mr. Drama himself. Breeze, just go right through me like that, man. Blew right on my neck. There's something, no, I, something I, I felt that, guys. And he housed it in his haunted museum in Las Vegas. Today, it's one of the museum's, hi it's one of the museum's highlights, actually, and it's touted as the world's most haunted object. Okay, so now I'm gonna do top liner and mascara, and I'll see how I feel about the look after that okay so i added a little bit of red that queen of hearts shade in the inner corner and then i also added a little bit of this uh shade from the juvia's place shade zuri from juvia's place right here in the inner corner i think i want to do a little bit of white eyeliner i don't know i'm kind of bad at doing graphic liner but you know, you have to practice, that's the only way you get better at it. So I'm gonna attempt to do some white eyeliner, like maybe like right here, and then maybe between these two. I don't know yet though. So I'm gonna play around with it. Um, if I end up liking it, it'll be in the final look. If not, that means I didn't like how it looked. So let's just try it. Okay, so that was low key on our deal, but I got there eventually. So next, I think I'm gonna take two highlighters so this is cognac from fenty and this is that color avalon from ColourPop. i think we're gonna lay cognac down first and then i'm gonna lay avalon on top of that and see cognac's like this like brownish cognac -y color so lastly for the lips i'm going to take that color ebony and then that gloss from pat mcgrath and i'm gonna do that and then i'll come back and do the outro so yeah that is gonna do it for this video here is the final look i do like how it turned out i actually ended up taking like i said ebony and then i lined it a little bit with this black liquid lipstick and then i dabbed this one in the center to get the lip look um but yeah guys i hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as i enjoyed making it like my other videos this is kind of like a brief look into dipic and jewish mysticism however i am not an expert so if there's anything that i missed or anything you want to add please do so in the comments respectfully of course all of the sources as well as all the makeup I use will be listed down in the description box as per usual. Please be sure to like, share, comment, subscribe if you have it. I have one more video in the series plan. I can't believe it's almost over, but you know, here we are. Time, what is it? Um, I feel like I look very, I don't know. I like this hairstyle. I think it, I don't, I don't ever do like a center part for anything. I think it looks like, I don't know, like very like scary spice. I feel like a, like, I don't know. I feel like a 90s girl watch or something. I don't know. Let me know. But I, I, I miss this though. I might keep doing this one. Please be sure to check out my unicorn video and my chimera video if you have it. And please be sure to stay tuned for next week with the final video in this series. 
You can find me on Instagram at DejaVu. You can find me on Twitter at DejaVu2. You can find me on TikTok at DejaVu3. However, I'm not really on there. And you can also follow my podcast, Grossly Overqualified, found everywhere the podcasts are found. So until the next video, the last one in the series, you guys have a good week, a good weekend, a good day, whatever you're watching this, and goodbye.